Uh, good morning. Um, thank you very much for joining this historic rally to mark the 30th anniversary of Sir John Major's safe haven in Iraqi Kurdistan. The rally is organised by the APPG on the Kurdistan region in Iraq in association with the Kurdistan regional government high representation in the United Kingdom. It's being recorded and streamed live on Kurdistan 24, Facebook at the KRG UK page and on YouTube. Great thanks are owed to Sir John. He took the issue to the British cabinet on March the 21st, 1991, Kurdish New Year as it happens, and within weeks persuaded the European Union and the United States to implement his notion of a safe haven and a no-fly zone for the Iraqi Kurds. They lasted until the liberation of Iraq in 2003. Millions of refugees, some of whom had been in neighboring countries since the 1970s and 1980s, returned to their homes in the largest refugee return since 1945. In 1992, they held elections to a parliament and formed their first coalition government on July the 4th. Despite a bitter civil war between 1994 and 1998, they laid the foundations of the modern Kurdistan region. Sir John's actions de defied foreign policy orthodoxies, which respected sovereign powers and certainly saved thousands or perhaps hundreds of thousands of Kurds. Without such focused military intervention, the Kurdistan region would probably not exist today. It was also the courageous Kurdistani uprising, the effective lobbying of Kurds, such as Foreign Minister Safin Dizayi, our vaccine minister Nadim Zahawi, and many more, the horror and then generosity of the British public, our service personnel, and our allies, France and America. They all saved Kurdistan, a firm ally in the continuing fight for religious pluralism an open society and reform in the Middle East. It proved that Kurdistan has more friends than the mountains. And I hope this rally will further increase good relations between our countries. First, Sir John, and then the Kurdistan region prime minister, Masroor Barzani. Sir John. Well, Robert, thank you very much. And thank you for those very kind and generous words, which are much appreciated. Um, I'd like to respond, if I may, immediately by congratulating you and the All Party Group uh, for all you've done to promote the interests of the Kurdistan region. I've no doubt you'll continue to keep their interests in the forefront of British foreign policy, and I think that is absolutely the right thing to do. I am also delighted that this webinar is marking the 30th anniversary of Safe Havens and No Fly Zones, and very honoured to be invited to contribute to it. I naturally remember that time with great clarity. The concept of safe havens was devised in London, supported by the European Union, accepted by the United States, and endorsed in the United Nations. And the Security Council Resolution 688 established no-fly zones specifically to protect the Kurdish nation from airborne attacks by the regime of Saddam Hussein. It was for the Kurds a truly frightening and terrible time, and one that they faced with great bravery and great resilience. But today, if I may, Robert, I'd like to look to the future. I have, of course, long retired from politics. I speak now as a private citizen, but a private citizen with a continuing affection for the Kurdish nation. I watch with admiration the bravery of the Peshmerga, the Peshmerga who suffered so many casualties in their fight against extremism. Their role has been critical, as indeed has the heartwarming generosity of so many Kurds and their families in offering homes and their support to over a million of their fellow citizens fleeing from war and from conflict. I know how much the British government values their relationship with the Kurdish regional government. And they do so for good reason. Our two countries share an opposition to extremism. They share also a common commitment to democracy and liberal values without which no citizen can ever be truly free in their lives. And such shared values make for long and lasting friendships. As I look ahead, I know that the Kurdistan region of Iraq 
can continue to rely on the support and goodwill of the United Kingdom. We've been proud in the past to offer technical and military support to the Peshmerga, including training, air support, and gifts of necessary equipment. But our commitment to the Kurdish nation goes beyond the military. It's focused on helping to improve the lives of Kurdish families. Many have suffered in ways perhaps that the outsider can barely imagine and suffered for a long time. To ease their hardship, the United Kingdom has provided humanitarian aid, aid including food, including healthcare, including funding to help restore vital services and improve the well-being of millions of people. So what is the British purpose in all that? I think it is very clear. It was in past governments and it is in the present government. It's an ambition to see a thriving Kurdistan region, one that can live in peace within an increasingly prosperous Iran. We wish to help Kurds, to help Kurds build a future, a future that offers the security, the jobs, and the opportunities to create an economy that will transform the lives of this and future generations of young Kurds. This ambition, this joint ambition with the government of the Kurdish region will continue to require close and friendly relations. It will require security cooperation, ever increasing business links and support for economic reform. But we can't achieve our ambitions alone. It will be a joint effort. It will require a partnership, not only with the Kurds in Iraq, but also with the United Nations and other willing international partners. Progress will need partnership, willingness to reform, a preparedness to put future well-being at the very centre of policy. And of course, a budget that is sustainable over the long term. I was delighted to uh, to know that the uh, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office Minister James Cleverly visited a bill a few weeks ago. I'm sure that James and his colleagues in ministerial office at the Foreign Office will maintain a keen interest in events and be continuing advocates for close relationships between Britain and the Kurdistan region. I'd like, if I may, to mention a more personal matter. I learned only two days ago that uh, a street in Erbil is to be named uh, after me to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the uh, activities of 30 years ago and the promotion of no-fly zones. I'd like to say to my friends in Kurdistan that I'm truly flattered by this generous gesture and would like to thank everyone who played any part in bringing it, is about, it about. I shall hope one day to be able to see that road in person. During my last visit to Erbil, I just missed that magnificent Kurdish spring, the celebration of Nowruz, and I was very sorry to have missed it. It is a time when your beautiful country is bathed in a carpet of spring flowers. It's a time also that tends to herald a new dawn. Kurdistan has celebrated 30 such dawns since those dreadful days under the regime of Saddam Hussein. Despite the heartbreaking sacrifices of the past, I believe Kurds should be enormously proud of what they collectively have managed to achieve since those difficult times. So I look forward with optimism to the many can be absolutely sure no one will be cheering louder at your success and your future happiness than your friends here in the United Kingdom. And with that, I wish you all a very enjoyable and stimulating webinar, and we'll hand over to the chairman of the All Party Group, Robert Halfon. Thank you very much indeed.
Um, thank you, Sir John. And I think that uh, one of the first places when we do visit Kurdistan one, again will be uh, the Sir John Major Street. So um, I hope very much that we get to do that. I'm going to pass on now to the His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Kurdistan. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Robert. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for participating. Sir John, uh, thank you very much for being here all distinguished guests. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, participate uh, today, marking the 30th anniversary of the safe haven and no-fly zone. I understand how important that was to support the Kurdish nation much in need at that time. This was a personal experience for me. I entered the mountains of Kurdistan when the uprising was on the way. For a few days, we celebrated the liberation of Kurdistan from tyranny and from all those decades of oppression. And then when the Republican army of Iraq, the Republican guards were unleashed, they came back and crushed the Kurdish opposition as they did also in the South. People in millions, sought refuge in the mountains and to the neighboring countries. And that's when the global community came together to support a compelling humanitarian intervention. I'd like to thank you, Sir John, for the role you played back then. I want to also recognize how important it was in rallying our partners, US, France, UK, and others to support this common cause. Of course, Operation Provide Comfort was the largest humanitarian mission in modern times, when all the basic needs were brought to the people, millions of people actually, that were stranded in the mountains and in difficult terrains. The intervention set us on a course to shape our destiny and manage our affairs ever since. It's also laid the foundation for lasting partnership with the US, France, UK, and others. The Iraqi opposition, after the, the uh, safe heaven was created, came back here and they were operating here. Until in 2003, they participated partially, partially in overthrowing the regime of Saddam at the time. We have remained true to our values to the shared values with you. We've transformed from a persecuted minority in Iraq to an advocate for others fleeing violence and persecution from Iraq and Syria. Kurds, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, Yazidis. They now all see Kurdistan as a second home. They see Kurdistan as a safe heaven for themselves to be protected. And this was reaffirmed with the last month visit of His Holiness, Pope Francis, when he came to Kurdistan. We know that we have a long road ahead of us. We've been trying everything we can to build a, thri a thriving society for Kurdistan, for Kurdistani people, and for all those who see Kurdistan as a safe heaven for themselves, even until today. Our journey has not ended. There is a lot we need to do together. We still need your support. We still need the support of the international community. We still need the support of UK, US, France, and all those who helped us to build this Kurdistan region that is a symbol of freedom and success of the biggest humanitarian convention in history. I would like to mention that during these times, we had some better times. But lastly, in 2014, the fight against ISIS, I think, was a turning point of Kurdistan showing how important it was that what you did back in 1991, Kurdistan's Peshmergas and Kurdish people were the ones that broke the myth of ISIS. It 
terrorist organization that was threatening the freedom of people and the security of the world. It was the Peshmerga's blood with the support of the coalition forces that defeated ISIS, defeated the caliphate of ISIS. But we have to also remember that terrorism is still out there. These terrorist organizations are still out there trying to reorganize themselves. And in order to contain the threat of terrorism, we still are in much need of cooperation with each other. Since then, Kurdistan has hosted hundreds of thousands of refugees and displaced people from different parts of Iraq and also from Syria. At one point, we were hosting about 2 million people. Now there is about 1 million IDPs and refugees that are still living in camps. The KRG alone is bearing the responsibility of providing the basic services to those with the cost of hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of dollars, in fact, annually to help these people that are living in camps. We are supporting their voluntary return to go back to their homes. But in order to do that, we have to provide a safe environment for their safe return to go back to their uh, homes in other parts of Iraq or for the refugees to return to their country. We cannot do this without the support of the international community. We are working closely with Baghdad and with Prime Minister Kadami to uh, provide such an environment for them. The latest uh, effort was the agreement that we had and signed with them on, on Shingal. Unfortunately, that agreement is not being fully implemented. So we are hoping that the Iraqi government comes forward and will provide such a safe environment for the return of all of these uh, IDPs to, to go back to uh, where they belong. Of course, regarding the relationship with the UK, we look at this relationship as strategic and also historic. I'm committed to increasing our bilateral trade and investment with the UK businesses. We are committed to promoting our political and security relationship with the United Kingdom and with all the allies that have helped us throughout this year. We are, we count on you, gentlemen, all of you that are here. I understand that all of you are friends of Kurdistan. I would like to call all of you today in many ways as advocates for Kurdistan that we want, to, we want to rely on you to champion our cause in the British Parliament, with the government, with the British businesses, and with the British people. I thank you, and I'll uh, let the chairman uh, take over from here. Thank you, Prime Minister, uh, and uh, thank you uh, again, Sir John. And we're going to move to the second part of our proceedings now and bring in some of the other uh, panellists. Um, I'd like to start off, please, with uh, Nadim Zahawi. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Robert Halfon and uh, uh, Prime Minister uh, Barzani, uh, Sir John Major. It is a privilege to be with you today, and I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Um, it, in 1991, I was a young man, a young British Kurd uh, who had campaigned uh, and had marched uh, up and down the streets of London uh, against the tyranny uh, uh, and the genocide being committed by the uh, Saddam Hussein regime, of course, earlier in 1988 in Halabja and the Anfal uh, uh, campaign that uh, took away 180 to 183,000 innocent lives, uh, not least amongst uh, the uh, Barzani family, of course. I will never forget uh, uh, those scenes in the mountains uh, uh, after Saddam's army had been pushed back uh, from Kuwait. And of course, uh, the Kurdish people had risen up uh, uh, for their rights, uh, but were being attacked 
uh, by that tyrannical dictator. And uh, I will never forget uh, Sir John Major's role in this, uh, not least because uh, he was able to convince his cabinet uh, and of course uh, his ally, George uh, Bush Senior, uh, that something needed to be done, something much more than just the humanitarian response, which he had already responded to so admirably, you know, pumping tens of millions of pounds and, and uh, uh, asking other nations to do the same, including, of course, uh, France and others, uh, but needed to go even further than that. Uh, and the no-fly zone policy, not an easy policy to implement or to get through uh, 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 the United Nations, but his determination working with allies like the United States, like France, uh, meant it became a reality. And I think uh, uh, not only did it protect the Kurds for 12 years, but I think in the first nine years, something like 280,000 sorties were flown uh, to protect the uh, Kurdish people. Um, my colleague, Jason McCartney, who's on this webinar, uh, was one of those uh, in the RAF who actually did the protection on the front line. And it's a privilege to have so many MPs here today on this uh, webinar. Um, Prime Minister Barzani, I know the Kurdish people uh, have, since those early days, have continued to uh, rely upon themselves to build uh, that democracy, that uh, tolerant society that welcomes uh, people of all religions and none uh, to uh, the land of the Kurds. Uh, and uh, you have followed in your father's footsteps uh, who I recall when we uh, landed in 1992, welcomed us in a snowy mountains of uh, Kurdistan uh, 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 with many people who are on this uh, webinar uh, so that we could see for ourselves how uh, the safe haven was working, but also how that money was being administered uh, through the United Nations and other organizations to help the Kurdish uh, people. And of course, since then, the Kurdish people have been uh, enduring further um, uh, hardship and challenges, not least with the murderous uh, ISIS uh, 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 attacking uh, the Kurds uh, and actually the Kurds being the front line, not just for Iraq uh, uh, and, and, and protecting their own um, lands, but also for the rest of us, the rest of the world as well. And I know now you are also enduring uh, the uh, challenges uh, of the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm really pleased as the uh, uh, COVID uh, uh, vaccination minister in the United Kingdom that, that the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has arrived in Kurdistan and in Iraq and that you are beginning to vaccinate and protect the most vulnerable against COVID. Um, uh, and uh, I absolutely uh, stand uh, with you in that challenge. I'm sure you will um, uh, come out of the other side and protect your people as we are doing in the United Kingdom. But we're here today to celebrate Sir John Major and his extraordinary um, uh, uh, decision to protect a nation. Uh, I think we all on this call who are members of parliament go into politics because we want to make a difference. But very few of us come out of politics uh, being able to claim that a policy that we championed, that we implemented, actually protected a nation, protected a people. And Sir John can make that claim proudly, which is why, uh, as I say, I wouldn't have missed this webinar for the world to be able to celebrate his name on a major street in Erbil for future generations, for future Kurds, to be able to uh, remember uh, his contribution and the United Kingdom's uh, contribution and friendship uh, to Kurdistan. And of course, sometimes they will ask the question, uh, when we are all long gone, who is John Major? And I hope their parents and grandparents will be able to tell them what John Major did for the Kurdish people. I congratulate you, sir. I salute you. And I'm absolutely in awe of everything you have done uh, for uh, uh, my people, the Kurdish people. Thank you very much indeed. Thank, Thank you. you.
Uh, Nadim, and I was very proud to travel with you first of all to Kurdistan a few years ago together with you. And um, I think your feelings are heartfelt amongst all of us. I'm going to pass over now to um, Gary Kent, who is secretary of the All Parliamentary Par uh, Party on Kurdistan, and uh, is going to give us a little bit of the history. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Rob. I wanted to start with uh, Seamus Heaney, uh, the great Irish poet who said, who wrote, history says, don't hope on this side of the grave, but then once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice rises up and make hope and history rhyme. That opportunity for Kurdistanis came in 1991. Discrimination and genocide appeared eternal until Saddam stupidly evaded Kuwait. The frantic weeks between his defeat and Sir John Major's safe haven saved the Kurds and decency in foreign policy. The other key heroes are, first and foremost, the Kurdistani people and their brave rebellion. Astute leaders such as Nadim Sahawi, who we've just heard, and uh, uh, Kak Safin Desai, who we'll speak later. Horrified public opinion, those who sent aid, MPs of all parties, and I'd like to give a special mention to uh, Labour's Anne Cluid, who spent five days in the mountains and was a powerful witness. And service personnel, Jason and uh, Tom are here. I've taken quite a few MPs to Kurdistan over the last uh, 15 years. And one of them, uh, the Deputy Speaker of the UK Parliament, Rosie Winterton, is at this rally too. And I'm very pleased to see her and others here. But the thing is, back in 91, Saddam cynically counted on mere warm words and wishes from the wider world. At that time, I looked it up, number one in the charts was, should I stay or should I go by the clash? It was also a political dilemma. The normal position would be to say, this is an internal Iraqi matter. It would have proved that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains and that the UK, in the words of Palmerston, only has eternal interests rather than allies. I'm very pleased to say uh, that Sir John Major rejected that real politique and his uh, moral pragmatism saved the Kurds who built a safe haven for religious groups, refugees and displaced people, as we've heard. The safe haven gave Kurdistan the freedom to build freedom, to paraphrase another Irish figure, Michael Collins. Uh, Kurdistan used freedom to build a parliament and expand universities. After the liberation of Iraq, it built a modern energy sector and boosted living standards. But life doesn't stand still. Our bilateral relationship can help build, for instance, better universities whose research and innovation can encourage enterprise, create jobs and diversify the economy after COVID and as carbons fade. I also hope that Kurdistan can build a film sector so we can hear the stories, their stories of the past, the present and the future. We're not today merely marking history, but seeking to make it. But bravo to Sir John and all those who saved Kurdistan. We have much more to do. But as they say in Kurdistan, uh, Barbroin, let's get on with it. And thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Gary. I'm going to pass over to my friend, Jason McCartney, who as uh, Nadim Zahawi flew in the RAF at the time. So Jason. Rob, uh, good morning. Uh, Sir John, uh, Prime Minister of, of the KRG. And, and can I also give a warm welcome as well to Nadim Zahawi, who's our vaccines minister, a particularly busy time for him this week. So for him to give up some of his incredibly uh, busy time just shows the importance uh, of this webinar. Minister, thank you uh, for joining us and honoured guests as well. Um, look, back in 1995, uh, I was a young uh, Royal Air Force uh, officer. Um, I, I, I actually um, uh, wasn't a, a pilot myself, but I was based in headquarters in Inchilic on Operation Warden, which was one of the follow-ups from uh, Operation uh, Provide Comfort. 
so I was there in headquarters where we actually operated the uh, fly zone, no fly zone uh, from there. But I was very fortunate to actually uh, fly into Iraq via Diyarbakir um, and uh, in a Hawk helicopter from uh, Diyarbakir uh, landing in Zako, which was the military uh, coordination centre uh, where we actually went out on patrols. Uh, into the Kurdish region villages. Um, and I was just really heartened as, as well at the, um, the appreciation, uh, the reception that we got, and also as well as uh, providing a safety and air cover for the people on the ground, we were actually providing uh, medical supplies, uh, we were providing electricity generators, um, and, and just giving real reassurance to the people there. Uh, nowadays, we take modern communications for granted. Of course, not everybody in the villages in the KRG region will have realized that the aircraft flying overhead at that time were in fact coalition aircraft and friendly, uh, and therefore they didn't need to run for cover. So it was a big role of reassurance uh, that we were playing, uh, operating out of uh, Zako, the MCC. Uh, I came into contact with the wonderful Peshmerga, uh, who provided our uh, security detail. And that's why when 18 years later, a long time later, as a member of parliament, and I was then the chair of the all party parliamentary group, Rob has now taken on that mantle. Um, I was delighted to return uh, to the KRG, uh, where we went to Erbil, and we went back to some of the areas that I had served in. Uh, 18 years earlier. And yet again, I was heartened uh, by the warm and welcoming reception that we got. But something that really struck me was when we visited Domi's refugee camp uh, near to the border with Syria, was the humanitarian support that the KRG was giving to refugees from Syria. So those that had received the support 18 years earlier, uh, in 1991, at the start of, of, of Sir John's support, were now giving support to others who had found themselves in a very, very similar situation. They had passed forward that goodwill, that humanitarian effort, that uh, willingness to help those fleeing from, from violence and death and, and persecution. And that's really struck by me. And I think that's why all of us here on this webinar today um, not only have a great sense of gratitude for what Sir John Major started, but also to everyone in the KRG for the way in which they have now passed that on to others. And they are standing there in support for those fleeing from the evil of Daesh, ISIS, wh whatever we're going to call them, uh, and standing up at all. So I would just finally end by echoing Sir John Wade Major's words, really. You know, we are all here to support freedom, uh, support peace, and also support a thriving economy. Um, I, I was really struck by the uh, economic ambition of the KRG, everyone I met in Erbil. And certainly when I go to my local university here at Huddersfield, um, I always sort of don't tell everyone at the university there. I always seek out the Kurdish students and ask them what they're studying. They're studying to be, you know, and, and female engineers as well. They're studying to be engineers. They're studying to be doctors. They're studying to be scientists. And they don't want to stay here in the UK. They want to go back to the Kurdistan region. They want to help the economy flourish. Um, I'm proud of what we've achieved. So, John, thank you very much. Uh, Prime Minister, thank you as well. Uh, I'm going to continue being part of the all-party parliamentary group. The work has begun, but there's a lot more work to do uh, through these challenging times, uh, and I want to be a part of it with Rob and all our parliamentary colleagues, and it's been a great honour joining you all here on this call this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, I'm, I'm, it gives me great pleasure to now introduce Captain Tom Hardy Forsyth, um, not only an advisor to the KRG, uh, but also to speak on his experience in the British Army in the safe haven. Uh, Captain. First of all, uh, I want to thank Sir John for doing something that I thought was impossible at that time as providing me as a soldier with a new moral compass, which I have never lo lost, with his quiet and insistent integrity. Thank you very much. As a British Army captain arriving 
in the spring of 1991 in the mountains of Kurdistan, I was greeted with almost unimaginable suffering. The mud, stink, children dying of dysentery, adults almost beyond despair. We had arrived to put a stop to the inhuman manhunt of innocent civilians following this uprising of, it's not too strong a word, of traumatized peoples against Saddam Hussein's regime. Having initially called for regime change, not only did the Allies not initially support it, but we foolishly gave Saddam the means to continue it by allowing his helicopter gunships to continue to fly in inverted commas for internal security purposes, actually just handling, handing him another license to kill civilians en masse. Furthermore, when I actually went to the mountains, I sort of expected the sort of destruction on a scale that a short, sharp conflict creates. But that isn't what I witnessed. What I saw was much worse. What I kept hearing everywhere from ordinary people in the mountains, terrified out of their lives to return back, was Anfal, Anfal, Anfal. The name, as we all know, of the genocide campaign against the Kurdish people. As I traveled around, I saw village after village that couldn't have been destroyed in just five minutes or even just a year. And when I say destroyed, I mean meticulously and with heartless industrial efficiency, which all had to be rebuilt again by the KRG. So despite the suffering that people were enduring in the mountains, there was a completely understandable reluctance to come back down. Actually, not just reluctance, absolute terror. And I have to be honest with this, because up till then, they were used to casual betrayal by the West over many years. We can't hide from that. These people had a shrewd historic insight. If they went into organized camps and were disarmed in the usual way, they could again be sitting ducks for Saddam, no matter what we promised them, because that had been their experience up until then. And shockingly, and again, Sir John was very important here, they were almost right again, because just as they were coming down off the mountains at the end of spring in May, having given our promises of protection, I was at a staff meeting at military headquarters in Zako. We were briefed by our American commander in chief of the Operation Provide Comfort that all allied military forces were to be replaced by a laughable United Nations Guard contingent of Iraq. Fortunately, for once, this was too much for some officials and the British public to swallow, and for Sir John. That wasn't going to happen. It wasn't going to be business again. And as a result of all of this, of course, the Allies agreed to mount Operation Poised Hammer, providing fast reaction forces if Saddam did renege and try to continue his dreadful plans. That's something a lot of people don't know about, Sir John, that he made sure that that wouldn't be repeated again. Well, 30 years have now passed, and a great deal has happened. Some good, not some, not, some not so good, and frankly, some downright evil, like ISIS. But the one thing that has moved me powerfully has been that when it came to the necessity to rescue, house, and protect tens of thousands of other refugees from other places, from ISIS and other dreadful forces, the Kurdish people, maybe as a result of their experience, but just as a result of their normal generosity, never hesitated or stinted in their response to help these people a tremendous cost and sacrifice, not just in money, but in the people themselves. For this and other reasons, I'm determined personally to keep my own promise that I made in the mountains 30 years ago to the Kurdish people, never to abandon them. I think I, like a lot of the people around here in this webinar, still have unfinished business. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Captain Tom Hardy Forsyth, for that. Um, it gives me great pleasure now to introduce uh, Safin Desai, the KRG foreign, foreign Minister, uh, but also who was an activist um, at the time in the United in the United Kingdom, a Kurd Kurdish activist. Welcome, uh, Foreign Minister. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, first, I would like to thank. 
um, APPG and uh, Care Energy Representation in UK for arranging this webinar, thanking uh, His Excellency Prime Minister Nasru Barzani for accepting this invitation, and also, of course, uh, John Major for being here and all of the colleagues. Um, I, uh, when the idea of uh, naming a street after Sir John Major, I was put to His Excellency the Prime Minister, immediately instructed the relevant authorities to find a uh, suitable a place that would be quite visible and in the heart of the city. And uh, a few days ago, I had the pleasure with uh, James Thornton, uh, the UK Consul General in Erbil, to unveil uh, that uh, um, the, the, the streets and the name of the street with uh, uh, a few other colleagues and the governor of Erbil and the minister of municipality. Um, I think the prime minister has very eloquently spoke about uh, the past, the present and the hopeful future. And indeed, Sir John Major touched upon that too. Hope, hope for future. Uh, I would like to share um, very briefly my own experience at the time when Minister Zahawi mentioned um, for people like us uh, who were living in exile in UK, of course, uh, at that time, uh, the Kurdish issue was very much confined to uh, very few news items, particularly during Halabja in 1988. But when the exodus occurred, and that as a result of the uprising, popular uprising of 1991, after the Iraqi army was evicted from Kuwait, the army, of course, was not uh, strong enough to uh, confront the, uh, the, the might of 36 nations. However, it was strong enough to fight its own people in the most terrible and uh, committing heinous crimes or suppressing the Shiite uprising in the south and then turning to the Kurds in, in the north. Now, of course, the Kurds remembering Halabja, they did not want to wait until the army arrives on their doorsteps because uh, they uh, very well remembered Halabja and Anfal. This is why they fled to the mountains. And because of the policy of destruction that had occurred earlier years, there were no settlements uh, between the cities and the mountains. So the more the people fled, they had no place to uh, take refuge. That's why they were stranded on the mountains along the border with Turkey and, and uh, Iran. And of course, the uh, moving pictures um, passed on to international TV stations at that time by various journalists, uh, which is highly appreciated. I think that was one of the um, uh, main uh, ways that to make the international community aware and the leaders to move. Now, of course, what happened in UK, from my personal experience, the uh, the what we could do then was picket outside Downing Street, uh, at, at the US Embassy in Grosvenor Square. Um, people like uh, Minister Zahari and many others, including former minister, uh, Iraqi foreign minister Hoshiar Zebari, the current uh, Iraqi president Barham Saleh, and many others. Um, so uh, we, we were trying to promote, we were trying to uh, get people uh, awareness of this. And uh, I think the, the, the pictures were moving enough for people to see it on their screens. And I remember all the pensions were actually donating their savings to some of the charitable organizations who were collecting food items and, uh, and other needs uh, for the uh, refugees. Um, and I remember very well when uh, a couple of dozen Kurdish activists uh, stormed the Iraqi embassy in London and they took over the embassy. Of course, their intention was not uh, uh, sinister, but they were trying to attract attention. And after a couple of hours with the arrangements with the uh, London police, they surrendered and they were taken to the court. And uh, it was very moving uh, because uh, the presiding judge uh, had seen these uh, dreadful images on the TV screens of these people dying in thousands per day. Uh, and with tears in his eyes, he dismissed the case, uh, uh, but he warned the, uh, the demonstrators uh, not to do this again. So what I'm trying to say, uh, the public at large, they were very much moved. And of course, uh, this was uh, very much, uh, uh, I would say, crowned by the initiative taken by Sir John and later by Security Council um, uh, Resolution 688. Um, luckily, uh, we were able uh, to have this uh, safe haven, which was later expanded from Zahra to Ahmadiyya and then uh, covering all of Kurdistan. Um, one thing which I uh, recall again uh, was uh, one of the filmmakers from UK, Gwyn Roberts, who had uh, produced a documentary film called uh, Dream Betrayed. Uh, he was in Kurdistan during the 
uh, jubilant days of the uprising. And then he also witnessed the, the exodus. So immediately he came back to UK. I think he was the first one to bring back those images. And he immediately called myself and a few other colleagues uh, to help him to translate the footages. Uh, there were tens of hours of, of filming. So we helped him. And we were, at, at one time, we were watching the jubilant uh, uh, days uh, of, of people, including uh, many people I knew, my immediate family also were in the picture. Uh, on the other, uh, uh, next door, there was the screen um, having the images of the stranded people. Um, and we, we, we didn't know what was going on and whether our own family members are amongst those fleeing. So it was quite a moving uh, image, but uh, nevertheless, these images uh, moved international conscience. And I think uh, what we have been able to, from, uh, to, to build 30 years on, despite the shortcomings, despite the loopholes, despite the uh, certain problems that we endure, but I think we have, uh, uh, have not let our friends down. Uh, but uh, I, I must say the story doesn't end here. We should be looking forward to the future. And the fact that we have been, been able to build a country with a free democratic election and not being an independent entity, yet we have been able to, to be a, 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 an important player in the regional politics and to a degree on international politics. So we would like to keep it uh, that way and we want to even develop it further. That can only happen with the support of our friends that have come to our help in the past. Um, Sir, Sir John Major, United States, United, uh, uh, France, uh, Germany, European uh, friends, neighboring countries, who also opened the doors to our uh, refugees. Uh, lastly, I would like to express uh, our appreciation for what has been done, and uh, we're looking forward to our future cooperation and to try to um, uh, to to um, uh, mend some of the. Uh, issues that are pending and to with the reforms that the government has and with the issues that we are facing, we are still have expectations from our friends. Uh, and and uh, as, as it's always been said, the, the mountains are not only our friends, we also have good friends like you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, what a wonderful tale of political activism. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to hear that story. Um, I'm going to pass on to our esteemed UK consul, uh, uh, a general in Kurdistan, who I've met on a number of occasions. And uh, it's a real great pleasure to have you here, uh, James Thornton, who's going to talk about bilateral relations. Robert, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the APPG. Uh, thank you to the uh, Kurdistan High Representation for organizing this event. Uh, thank you to Sir John and to um, His Excellency, uh, the Prime Minister, Kek Mazuro Bazani, uh, for your presence. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk about is um, uh, the UK response in 1991. Um, uh, we've, we've touched on various aspects of this. Um, the first thing I think was uh, the importance of uh, a number of UK journalists um, getting out uh, into the mountains to, uh, to, to tell and to film the story of uh, the Kurds and their suffering um, in the, because of, the, uh, of what Saddam was trying to do. Um, and we, we have to thank them for uh, getting the images on our TV screens. Um, there was also quite clearly a big outpouring of, of support and um, and concern amongst the British public as a whole um, for uh, the plight that they were seeing on their screens. Um, there was a uh, major donations uh, to, uh, of humanitarian assistance uh, through UK-based charities um, by ordinary people. And, in, and indeed, a friend of mine, um, uh, Harder Van, uh, persuaded his friends to buy food and blankets and so on to put in the van and drove it himself all the way across Europe, all the way across Turkey uh, to, to hand over to uh, those in the camps um, as his own personal contribution. And I, I don't think that was, I, mean, I know that wasn't an isolated ca case. There are a lot of similar ordinary people uh, doing something similar. Um, then what John Major did was um, he, he encapsulated that response in what was quite, in, in, in political terms, quite a revolutionary um, action. This was eight years before the doctrine of responsibility to protect. 
It was, I think, the first time that um, uh, we had uh, th that uh, the international community had decided to intervene uh, to protect a group of citizens uh, within a country that didn't want them, to, whose government didn't want them to come in. So, um, and uh, Sir John drove the, uh, the, uh, the built a consensus in the international community that uh, this needed to be done. And I think that was a, a really major achievement. And then, of course, we've heard about um, the uh, military commitment that followed that um, on the ground um, and in the air. My next point is to say that uh, the Kurdistan region has um, transformed itself since then. Um, the Kurds are no longer an oppressed people the way they were under Saddam. Um, they have a very high degree of autonomy uh, within uh, uh, the state of Iraq. Um, in UK terms, Scottish terms, it would be Devo Max Max. Um, and they're able to, they are masters of their own futures in, uh, to a very substantial extent. Um, and I think that is a, a real achievement. Um, now, to come to the UK's relations uh, with the Kedistan region, um, Sir John actually um, put it much better than, than I can right at the beginning, but let me run over some of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, the, the features. Um, I lead um, a large consulate general um, here in Erbil. Um, it has more diplomats in it than probably the majority of British embassies uh, in countries uh, around the world. Um, and uh, that and so and we're and we're correspondingly active. Uh, we had not one but two British ministers visit together um, in December last year uh, to uh, to see uh, the situation in the Kurdistan region and to recommit uh, the UK uh, to the region. So there was uh, James Cleverly from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office and James Heapy from the uh, Ministry of Defence. Um, Sir John talked about shared values and common interests, and that's absolutely right. Um, we've got a major common interest in defeating Daesh, uh, which is unfortunately not defeated. And so we, uh, security cooperation is a large part of uh, what we do um, here in the region. Um, we uh, have sought to give as, what, uh, as much support as we can to the, uh, the Kurdistan regional government in its dealings with the government um, in Baghdad. Um, uh, congratulations to the uh, Kurdish government um, on the uh, successful uh, budget deal that they struck only last week. Um, we were lobbying for that um, in Baghdad um, on a pretty constant basis um, through our embassy there. Um, uh, we need to move on from there. Now that's sorted out um, to sort out issues of security cooperation um, between um, uh, the region and uh, the, the national governments. Um, we want to see, uh, uh, to find uh, political solutions to problems such as those in Sinjar uh, to enable uh, the Yazidis um, who fled from Sinjar uh, to be able to go home. Um, and we're focused on that. And we want to see a broader, more broadly in the longer term, a full implementation of the provisions of the Iraqi constitution as regards uh, the KRI and the disputed territories. Um, we have since 2014 given uh, approaching 300 million pounds worth of humanitarian assistance um, in Iraq. Um, and a substantial proportion of that has gone to uh, the Kurdistan region because um, the Kurdistan region has been so generous in hosting uh, displaced people um, as a result of the, the, uh, the Daesh atrocities. Um, and with it, but more specifically within the region, um, we, as I said, we have strong security cooperation. We're working within the, um, uh, the Ministry of Peshmerga Affairs uh, supporting them to effect a reform and modernization um, of the uh, Kurdish armed forces, the Peshmerga. We are now sending a steady stream of uh, the Peshmerga's best cadets, officer cadets, to Sandhurst. And indeed, um, the first female cadet uh, graduated from Sandhurst uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, another uh, is due to graduate, and a male cadet graduates next week, and a, uh, another female goes uh, very shortly. 
Um, we're doing up the updating of the military curriculum in military and staff colleges um, in the region. Uh, we have support to the Kurdish judiciary. We send every year uh, eight or 10 of uh, the brightest and the best of the younger generation to finish their studies in the UK uh, in the hope that they will come back and become leaders of the future um, in the Kurdistan region. That's through our Achieving Scholarship Scheme. And the, uh, the consulate is very committed to uh, promoting the empowerment of women across the region. We want to see uh, economic reform, economic transformation within the region, and um, uh, we want the region to benefit uh, fully from the Iraq uh, Reform, Recovery and Reconstruction Fund, uh, World Bank Fund, to which we were the first uh, donor. Um, we also want the, uh, the region to be a true beacon of human rights, as it already is in so many ways, including on religious freedom. But the relationship between the UK and the Kurdistan region isn't just government to government. Um, the, a lot of civil society interest um, uh, in the UK, in the region, there's the APPG, of course, in Parliament. Uh, there are British-based NGOs and charities that do work here. Uh, we have academic links, uh, the British Museum and universities uh, conduct um, archaeological excavations here. And of course, there's a large Kurdish diaspora in the UK, which shows a lot of interest in the Kurdistan region. And I'm keen that we should um, harness all of these to strengthen the bonds that exist between the United Kingdom and the Kurdistan region. In conclusion, it's a fantastic honor for me to serve here uh, as the British Consul General. I love working here. The Kurds are wonderful people. And we were friends of the Kurds in 1991. I think we've shown that. We remain friends of the Kurds and we will continue to be friends of the Kurds and the Kurdistan region of Iraq for a very long time to come. Thank you. And thank you so much, um, uh, James, for that. It's really important. I'm now going to pass on to our, also our uh, distinguished uh, Kurdistan uh, representative in the UK, Karwan, uh, please. Thank you, Rob, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Your Excellency Prime Minister, Sir, uh, Sir John uh, Major, dear uh, colleagues, today is a historic day for the United Kingdom's history and Kurdish nation's history. Therefore, it is worthwhile celebrating together uh, and being proud of shared uh, achievement. 30 years ago today, it was proven that humans are living in an integrated and connected world, no longer where the oppressed people left to their own limited resources and determination to resist and defy challenges uh, to their very existence. That reality came to light uh, with the endorsements of uh, UN Security Council Resolution 688 that call on state to rescue a nation from further genocide. This resolution was endorsed and implemented through Sir John Major's bold initiative in Iraqi Kurdistan that advocated for safe heaven, saved and saved the whole nation from further genocide. That decision in real politics is called a game changer. In, uh, it rightly constituted a subjective transformation in international policy towards their responsibility to protect. I'm pleased that British government's uh, recent comprehensive review will create a conflict prevention center that would make the UK respond more effectively and use all its resources to meet its diplomatic goal. Uh, some atrocities and conflict could have could have not been uh, could have been prevented if this conflict prevention center has existed 30 years ago. In our case, Sir John Major was a one-man genocide prevention unit. Then, in addition to the international implication, uh, uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 688 also had um, um, uh, regional and international implication. Uh, it shone light uh, the Kurdish people's plight. Uh, ever since then, uh, we have been able to, um, uh, to govern ourselves and to achieve immense progress in many areas. Today, we thank John Major 
and argue that as much as the decision was necessary then, it is even more important today uh, in preserving the uh, success story of the Kurdistan region and in ensuring that the Kurdistan region continue to be a force of stability and prosperity in the Middle East. I don't want to repeat what has been said, but I, as representative of a nation that has been uh, rescued and saved 30 years ago from elimination, now I am proudly presenting, uh, representing them within the legal and constitutional framework here in the United Kingdom, which I have been mandated to promote deeper bilateral relationship with the United Kingdom um, at all level. It is with great pleasure and pride, uh, I will highlight some uh, significant development in our bilateral relationship. Our representation is working steadfastly to expand tie between our two nation through government to government relation, uh, scientific and education association, as well as cultural um, connection. We work with official and businesses uh, and business bodies to further develop area of cooperation uh, between the Kurdistan region and British, Britain. With respect to parliamentary affair, our good friend, MPs and peers have demonstrated their interest uh, in, uh, in Kurdistan through the all party parliamentary group on Kurdistan uh, region for the last 15 years. They have played instrumental role in promoting and securing a link that built on our relation, uh, uh, our long standing relationship. This successful rally is a testament of our long and deep friendship. As for the economy, we have for long sought robust bilateral um, economic relationship. Many British companies operate in Kurdistan region and more to come to join the uh, emerging market where there is a wealth of opportunities and uh, great demand for British expertise across multiple sectors, especially in uh, agriculture and tourism. We also enjoy excellent uh, educational tie uh, and collaboration between the UK uh, between Kurdistan and uh, British universities on a range of uh, projects. Additionally, culture also plays a vital role in shaping our bilateral relationship with the UK. Uh, uh, we thank the UK government and British Museum for supporting the Kurdish uh, archaeologists uh, to prevent, uh, to preserve our rich cultural uh, heritage. We share values and interests as it has been rightly uh, reiterated recently by the Right Honorable James Clevery, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office State Minister, who emphasized uh, our many shared interests and values aligned, including a strong belief in diversity, tolerance, and uh, countering um, uh, uh, extremism. We highly value the British government's uh, uh, emphasis on a strong Kurdistan region. The Kurdistan region is grateful for this long-standing uh, uh, partnership with the UK. Many milestones uh, has uh, been achieved, and we hope that through a continuation and amelioration of this relationship, we can better serve um, our mutual interest uh, in promoting peace and stability in the wide region. Indeed, I would like to take this opportunity to expand my profound gratitude to the uh, British public opinion then and now, uh, which has uh, become uh, even more uh, supportive. Thanks uh, also to the uh, British journalists, uh, photographers and reporters that brought to light uh, the, uh, uh, the plight of the Kurdish people uh, worldwide. I also uh, would like to acknowledge the role of uh, the Kurdish diaspora in the UK, as everyone alluded to it, as a very uh, uh, active community within uh, the British multicultural society who have played their role in uh, swaying public um, uh, opinion. Uh, in the end, I would like to salute the victims that dedicated their life and fallen in the freezing mountain 30 years ago during uh, Kurdish exodus. Thanks to all who have helped us and supported us to become what we are uh, now. And my particular thanks to APPG, yourself, and all colleagues, and our good friend that have been uh, a driven force in supporting Kurdistan and strengthening our bilateral relationship on money front. Thank you, and back to Europe.
Thank you, uh, Carwin, and for all you do to promote Kurdistan in the United Kingdom. I think, uh, I hope the Prime Minister doesn't mind me saying we're very lucky, uh, your country's very lucky to have you uh, here representing um, Kurdistan in the way that you do. Um, um, we've heard from eyewitnesses how a good people was saved from Saddam Hussein in a few hectic weeks in March and April 1991. It brought out the best in all of us. And most importantly, it saved Kurdistan, without which the Middle East and the world would be bleaker and more dangerous today. If Sir John Major hadn't acted, thousands of Kurdistanis would have faced further genocide and the Kurdistan region would not uh, exist in its modern form. What would have been the fate of nearly two million people who fled from Syria and Mosul without the KRG? What would Iraq look like without the positive role that Kurdistan plays? The APBG has taken me and my colleagues there several times and opinion formers and uh, many others. We can see the achievements that the KRG have made in very difficult conditions and its flaws, the need for continuing reform and its potential. We have a full agenda for building a bigger and better bilateral relationship with the Kurdistan regime uh, region for our mutual benefit. We want more British investors and institutions to invest in Kurdistan. And we ask that the government sends a trade mission there after COVID. We can do so much to help improve higher education, increase the mental health resilience of its people, expand its agriculture, not least the pomegranates from Halabja and much more. I can promise you that we will return to Kurdistan as soon uh, as it is possible. I also pledge that we'll do all we can as an APBG to foster friendship between our peoples. None of this would be possible without Sir John Major and Tony Blair. And we should be very proud of what the UK and the Kurds are doing together. And just to make the final concluding uh, remarks, it gives me great pleasure to pass over to my co colleague, Alicia Kearns, who served in Iraq as an FCO official, Alicia. Your Excellencies and all my colleagues and speakers today. I have the privilege of bringing our event to a close today and it is an honour uh, for you all to share your memories of those events 30 years ago. Because 30 years ago, under Sir John Major's leadership, the UK refused to sit by in silence and we refused to let the Kurdish people be silenced. And whilst it is common for us to say never again and never forget, in this case, that really should be what we do. Because the actions of 30 years ago should serve as a memory that when we act according to our values and when we refuse to sit by and when the international community is united in its efforts and certain of its ends, we can save lives. And by recognizing our responsibilities to the Kurdish people, we save tens, if not hundreds of thousands of lives. And that is a bright spot of humanitarian leadership in a decade that was too often filled with atrocities that went unprevented. It has been wonderful to hear such a variety of contributions. Rob, our chair, making clear that we plan to stand by the Kurdish people as parliamentarians and do more to further their cause. The KRG High Representative and our Consul General talking about how we must support the Kurdish people to be masters of their own destinies and that we have so many shared interests from our security to the prosperity of Kurdistan and the region. The Foreign Minister spoke about the experiences of Kurds who lived here in exile. And I know from my own time uh, in Kurdistan that it's not uncommon to hear a South London accent, which wasn't something I necessarily expected when visiting Kurdistan. And also that it was the British people, not just the government that wanted to stand by the Kurds. My colleague Jason spoke of his pride of our servicemen in enforcing the no-fly zone and safe haven. Whilst it was moving to hear Captain Sir Tom Hardy Forsyth bring to life the reality of what servicemen confronted on the ground. I wish particularly to thank Gary Kent for bringing together today's fantastic event. And I apologize, I have an 11 week old baby who's just chosen to wake up. Uh, but he has worked so hard with Ambassador Carwan to rightfully raise that together we can bring a brighter future for Kurdistan. And we heard from my colleague Nadim Sahawi of his recollections of fighting for his people and how the Kurdish people make up the front line protecting the world from Daesh. And I was personally privileged to have worked with the Global Coalition Against Daesh and the Kurdish people and it was that time in Iraq and Erbil that introduced me to the beauty of the Kurdish people. Because Kurdistan provides an oasis of freedom and kindness to those most in need. Safety to refugees of all creeds and Prime Minister Barzani discussed the ways in which Kurdistan has opened its arms as a safe haven to others. 
But finally, Sir John rightfully spoke at the start about the beauty of Kurdistan and of Kurdistan in springtime and the responsibilities we have to stand by our friends and allies. And he is right to do so, because too often when we speak of our Kurdish friends and allies, it's to speak of atrocities, of memories that will never be, and of conflict and facing threats as brothers and sisters in arms. And we all know there is more to be done to stand by our Kurdish allies and protect them from those who still seek to silence them. But for all of us on this event today, I believe that Kurdistan and its people represent strength and beauty and a joy and pride in a culture and nation that we want more people to come to know, experience and love. I was but three years old when the events just we discussed today took place. And I say this because it's vital that we educate our younger generations about the atrocities our friends have faced and how when we come together, we can make a difference if we remain true to our values and marshal the international community. So I thank you, Sir John Major, for all you did to enable the British people to hold our heads high. And for every family you saved and every memory that has been created thanks uh, in Kurdistan, thanks to all you did. It's a well-known phrase that sadly too often has been true, that the Kurds have no friends but the mountains. But I think today we say to the Kurdish people, and this demonstrates in a small way, that 30 years on in the UK, you will always have a friend, a friend who is grateful for your friendship and who will stand with you. And we all say, may the Kurdish sun never set. And we thank you for your friendship because it truly is a blessing. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, I think you spoke for all of us. And um, with that, we bring proceedings to a close. Thank you to our distinguished uh, guests, particularly uh, Sir John Major and uh, um, uh, Prime Minister. Um, it's been an honour to have both of you at our seminar and uh, wish you, we wish you all well. Thank you, Chairman. If, uh, if I may just say a couple more words uh, as we, we are concluding this uh, webinar. I, once again, I thank you uh, for all your contributions in the past and for your continuous relationship in the future. I just wanted to mention a couple more points. I was told by uh, our Minister of Health that uh, we are in talks with the AstraZeneca to, to, uh, to get some of the vaccine. So I wanted to uh, mention this to Minister Zahawi. And uh, uh, since, since we are doing this through a video conference, I just remember something that back then, as many of you told your stories. And uh, as I said, it was a personal experience for me and uh, literally just six, seven kilometers from where I stand today, when all the civilians were fleeing and the Iraqi army was chasing the, uh, the, the civilians. Uh, there was, there was a Kore Valley just not far from here, and like I said, six, seven kilometers from here. They were stopped by some Peshmergas who resisted and, and fought back. The next day, there was another journalist that I would like to remember today and mention him because he, he, he played a key role and he was uh, Jim Miller. He was with us and uh, unfortunately, because he didn't have, uh, we didn't have any ways of communicating. He, he had to use some military radio to communicate back with uh, uh, London. And, and he was the one that actually brought the news to us that uh, Sir John Major, the back prime minister, uh, had this proposal of uh, creating a safe heaven, whether the Kurds would accept that or not. And I remember very well that my father was actually very happy to hear the idea and immediately said, yes, we are all for it. So I just wanted to mention that and uh, Sir John, uh, I wanted to uh, mention about the uh, street that is named after you, but since you mentioned it, I didn't know that you had heard about it. But <laughs> since you mentioned it, I, I just wanted to say this, that you live in our hearts. You live in the hearts of the Kurdish people who know you, who lived through those times. But this street is just a gesture of appreciation, especially for the newer generation to know who you, who you are. Once again, thank you, Sir John, and thank you, all of you, for all you've done. And we are looking forward to working even closer with, with all of you in the future to create a better Kurdistan and a more stable region. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, um, everybody, and thank you again for, for today's uh, webinar. It was a very special occasion.